in this unique and special one-off presentation, witness first-hand behind-the-scenes footage, including all the dressing room chat and back chat. These scenes have never before been captured on film, but that's not all. Find out what a day in the life of a footballer on tour is actually like. And is this payback for playing for the opposition? <laughs> and is it Stevie or Shaggy? Does anyone know? Shaggy. Steve. Steve. It'll be Shaggy when I got here, it'll be Shaggy when I leave. And Vladimir Romanov shares his inner thoughts about the club and reveals the depth of his commitment directly to you, the Hearts fans. As long as Lady Luck allows and my health goes on, I'll be here at Hearts. Vlad also invites you all to his very own fight club. Come on, come on, come on. From season to season, the beautiful game goes on, chasing titles, chasing cups, and chasing Europe. But what happens when the final whistle blows at the final game? Little is known about this important part of the football calendar. But now, for the first time, all is revealed in Hearts, the pre-season story. It's Saturday, the 28th of July, just one week before the start of the season, and Hearts are up against one of the biggest and greatest teams in the world. Spanish giants, Barcelona. It's a glamour fixture, attracting fans in their tens of thousands, breaking all previous attendance records. This is a climax to a gruelling pre-season build-up that started five weeks earlier on the 27th of June. Almost the entire club is on the move. 34 players, two physiotherapists, two masseurs, three coaches, three ground staff and kit masters, one sports scientist, one marketing manager and all checked in by fitness coach Tam Ritchie. And last but not least is David Southern the club's communication director. Pre-season is an important uh, part of the overall programme in the, in, throughout the whole season for the club. The importance of pre-season is you bring the boys back after um, their holiday season. You bring them back as a group, they've just left their families, but it's very important that from day one you start the bonding process with the team. And a lot's been made of hearts and unrest and cliques and different nationalities sitting at different tables. And I think particularly when you've got a multinational squad as we do, it's important to bring the lads together to bond them. Because if you will laugh with a player, joke with a player, eat with a player, drink with a player, you'll also fight for that player in the pitch. And that's crucial to the development of the club on field. First stop is Austria. After six days training and two warm-up matches, the bandwagon moves on to the main event in the Austrian capital, Vienna. A city steeped in music, culture and architecture. There's a saying in Vienna that if you hang around long enough, you're bound to bump into at least one famous face. Vladimir Romanov has just flown in to find out how the squad and coaching staff are progressing. 
and assess for himself just what has to be done for the season ahead. I always try to come and be with the team for pre-season. It's one of the most interesting times. It does give you an idea of how the season might go. We're trying new players. A lot depends on it, on new formations we try, on the team spirit we create. I'm interested in being here for such moments in the club's life. I also spend 50% of my life attending to football and I'm scared to say how much I put in emotionally and financially, but I have to be here. Well, we're on our way to uh, France Hall Stadium to play Austria Vienna. Lawrence Brode is the only one that knows where it is. So what are you expecting uh, tonight? I mean, do you know the team? We had a look at the, what your opposition. Tonight? Yeah, we know that they're obviously they're a good team. They're in the UEFA Cup. Obviously, the season starts next week, so they'll be further along in their preparations than we are. I spoke to some of the people at the, the stadium this morning. They're expecting a crowd maybe of three or four thousand. We already saw one or two Hearts fans in, in, in the city, so no, it's, it looks for a good game and the pitch is in, in top condition. Yeah, it's a lovely night for a game of football, so we can't wait to get started. All right, so looking forward to the game. Are you looking forward to the game? <laughs> Uh, yes. I just asked him that, you know. Yes, he said yes. He's looking very much forward to the game, uh, and hope that we get <laughs> and and hope we win the game. I speak fluent Russian, but I, I use Tino just to just to keep him in a job sort of thing. But my Russian is pretty much as, as, as best you could probably can have. Uh, you want to give us an example? Then? Nah, not for the cameras. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want to, to show lose Tino his job. You know. Still good speaking the Russian. Yeah. What's that? Good speaking the Russian. Yeah. Understand better. He understands better. Yeah. Okay. That was Russian. He said I speak good Russian. <laughs> <laughs> Sporting director Anatoly Korobochka and assistant head coach Stevie Freo have been working together with the first team since March. They effectively replaced Edward Malafiev, a football legend in the former USSR, as head coach after he presided over Hart's worst spell in 40 years. Despite the encouraging scoreline, the tension mounts and the guidance from the touchline goes up a gear. At half time, Hearts lead 1 0. You said that the game was five minutes, a wee bit of quiet. It's like Princess Street. Sit down and give us five minutes. Jesus. Right? Shush. It's not like that during the season, I think, because they think it's pre-season and they don't need to get the same information. But come like league games and, and normal games during the season, it's, it's a little bit more calm uh, to try and get your points across at half-time. That's the switch of direction of play that Edward's talking about. 99% of the time he's, he's saying what I'm saying, but just it's a different way of, of him getting it across. Obviously the language thing first and foremost, but just the, the way he, he tries to deliver it. But I mean, there's times that he'll speak to the interpreter who will then come to me, but it's things I've, I've seen, but there's things that I've maybe not seen. But most of the time it's pretty much the, the same idea. I know sometimes it doesn't look that way. <laughs> Come on, come on, 
Wir haben hier einen Wechsel an die Technik und auch von euch. And if you get something in a situation like that, you just don't take risks. So Saul dragged them out, and I think quite rightly so. So, he's feeling better. Meanwhile, on the sidelines, Malafiev is red carded for unruly behaviour. This, as it turns out, is his last game in the dugout. Although he still remains in charge of training. A narrow victory. But what's the verdict from the stand? Not very much. Not that happy. It was almost like when you were at high school and there was a fight in the playground, there was a, a melee of bodies round about encouraging. <laughs> And uh, we couldn't believe it when we saw Mr. Romanov and, and Roman uh, squaring up. It was, a, it was a left jab that I could see. It was a good left jab. It was fun for everybody. I made team spirit again well, so... <laughs> Just after the game, Bednar said OK to a fight, and he put his gloves on and got stripped down. And I looked at him, and I thought, oh no, he's got too many advantages. He's too tall, he's too big, he's got big muscles, and his tummy muscles are too strong. I was going to hit him in the stomach, but because he's so tall, I won't be able to hit him in the head. I then realized that if I could open him up, and so I did, and I managed to hit him on the head twice. Maybe I won't read much because everybody laughed at me. So. But in every joke there is a part of truth to it. So maybe it was Vladimir giving an indication to the coaching staff in how you should teach and uh, educate footballers. Uh, it's not an educational method, fighting, but uh, it can make you think. Come on, baby, come on, come on. Every fan is aware of the club's turbulent history over the last decade. And during this time, many staff and coaches have come and gone. But what has it been like from the inside? David Southern joined Hearts just months after Vlad took control. The one word that the, the fans use more often than we do, I think, is roller coaster. Yeah. Now, the thing that keeps you going are the rest of your colleagues, the staff at the club, because the staff love the club and there isn't a member of staff that is working at Hearts that isn't interested in the club. We all are, we all want the best for the club. And it's because we want the best for the club that we do bond well together. We do not work on 12-hour you know, cycles, 12-day cycles, 12-month cycles even. You know, we're looking 10 years ahead and that takes vision. And that's a very, very important word as far as Hearts are concerned. If you heart back two and a half years ago, three years ago, Hearts I think it's not too extreme to say Hearts was going out of business. We were heading to Murrayfield where we'd be playing to crowds of probably less than 10,000. We only had 7,500 season ticket holders at that point. We've got 13,500 now. We're filling our stadium. And you know, I just feel that the club has moved on. It's been painful. It's been a painful process. But you do not progress as a business without some degree of pain. Despite the upheavals, Stevie Shaggy Frail has remained on the coaching staff and now finds himself at the very sharp end. 
it was an opportunity just to come in and, and help out John McGlynn with the 19s. Greg thought I could maybe go and watch games from and stuff. So when John moved on, uh, it meant I was asked to step up and be first team coach. And I must admit, although you can see different things and different inputs in that, it's a position I wouldn't change and I must admit, I love every minute. Last season showed that Anatoly Korobochka and Stevie Frail did well in a complicated situation. And I'm thinking about keeping them, as they're working well together in tandem. And just for pre-season, to try and help them and strengthen them, I asked Eduard Malofiev to come and work here as well. He's got very good experience which I think is good for us to try and use. After just four days back in Edinburgh, the bandwagon is on the move again. This time to the small German town of Meshkede, deep in the Ruhr Valley, where they'll be based for 10 days for intensive training and several warm-up matches. The squad are staying at the four-star Hennessy Welcome Hotel. Ein schönen guten Tag, Welcome Hotel Hennessy Residence. My name is Sabrina Buse. Hat auf Melodien. Yes, one moment, please. The first task is to set up their own dining and treatment rooms. For players and staff on a grueling training schedule, this becomes the centerpiece of the hotel and also the place to vent some spleen without fear of retribution. <laughs> if Trapatoni was a manager, the players would still moan. Players are like that. That's true, Robbo, though. There's a few good ones. And for an educated man like Andy Murray to come out with, we walked around that big square in a circle. So it sort of says it up, really. It's, it's maybe time to go home. However, the treatment room is also a very serious place, crammed full of medical professionals. Physiotherapist Rob Marshall has been with Hearts for 15 months. Molly's uh, strained his quadricep, which is a pretty common injury once again in, in pre-season. Quadriceps are very powerful muscles um, and you know, very important for footballers. And coming back pre-season after a bit of a rest, they need a, they have obviously an adaption to training and sometimes doing some of the more dynamic exercise, you know, they can strain. I've worked in, um, back home in New Zealand, I worked with a professional team in, in New Zealand that's in the Australian A-League, and then I worked at Sheffield Wednesday, um, and then I've come to Hearts from Sheffield Wednesday. You know, Sheffield Wednesday's a, a, a good club, but um, the role here was, a, you know, a better role, and Hearts, to be fair, have got better, you know, better, better set up, better facilities, and a chance to work with some some good other kind of health professionals up here, so it's a good decision. The training ground and facilities are a few kilometres away and were chosen by ex-head coach Valdas Ivanauskas, who had trained here while playing for Austria Vienna and SV Hamburg. Previously assistant head coach with CSK Moscow, New sporting director Anatoly Korobochka has his own special way of assessing the squad. When you observe from the sidelines, you see a lot of things you don't see when you're in the middle of it. And it has been very enlightening in the sense that I have been able to see a lot and to understand how players operate and to understand their mentality and to understand how the coaching staff operate and work. If I get the opportunity to work with the team in the future, I would like to base my future work at Hearts on what I saw on this pre-season and uh, how I see people operating, uh, assessing their mentality and their uh, thinking. As Anatoly ponders the football on the pitch, others are interested in the football off the pitch. Um, it's nine million, apparently, from an English club. Go on, go on. 
is it, um, I think it's Sunderland, so 9 million, so obviously I'm going to focus my interest on Craig for a wee bit, and if it does become true, well, it's going to be one of the highest transfer fees in Scotland, I've got other players to do as well, um, but um, Craig's quite topical just now, <laughs> as you can imagine. In many ways it's a compliment to Hearts um, that a player such as Craig will attract um, such a value, but Craig's still training with the team. We've not seen him departing in the middle of the night with his suitcases packed, so he's still here. He's training this morning, um, and as I say, until you know any, there's no deals done until you know the ink's dry in the paper. So we'll continue as normal. Despite any distractions off the pitch, the squad knuckles down to the two training sessions a day, and always at the centre of the action is fitness supremo Tam Ritchie. My view is that hard work's never killed anyone, you know, and uh, regardless what, what, what type of training you're training at, at that specific time, you're going, to, you're going to improve. Ah, any signs? As an experienced teacher and coach, Tam has been pushing the players to the limit for the last five years. Five going with yellow mask. Is it a love-hate relationship to have with them? No, they just hate them. <laughs> Basically, they just hate them, and you can see why. Uh, but the, the, he just he jumps about like Zebedee, and he's always got a smile on his face. I'm the voice. I'm the one who gets to shout at them, and uh, I'm the enemy, fortunately. The things that he does, he changes it every day. It's varied. And, uh, it can be the most varied warm-up in the world, but mean nothing, but it's varied to the degree that it keeps them fresh and that also what he needs to get from the warm-up he gets. Uh, by the time that we get them ready to start the football, they're, they're ready to, to go and they're, at the level they're sweating nicely and they've got a wee sprint on and they're, they're ready to work. Both Stevie and Tam are aware that the mood and conditions on the training pitch are crucial to the player's development and sense of well-being. And one of Stevie's many skills is creating a strong team spirit and congenial atmosphere. A team! You know Stevie Phil? Do you call him Stevie or Shaggy? I call him Shaggy. And why do you call him Shaggy? Um, I don't know if I'll be allowed to, to tell you that. Shaggy. I call him Shaggy, yeah. <laughs> Even though I don't know why. No, no. I'll get to the bottom of it one day. Stephen in a shaggy. Steve. Steve. I call him Shaggy. Shaggy, I don't know why. Because this... I didn't play with him. For me, he's Steve. I actually don't know why he's called Shaggy. I've never found that out. I don't know why. I don't know why. Maybe in the past, he yeah, has something... Uh, <laughs> which I, I don't know. When he played for Hearts originally, he had quite a uh, sort of curly, moppy hair. I've not got a Scooby. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's Scooby too. <laughs> I was a young lad at Dundee and I came in one night for a reserve game and one of the, the senior pros saying, i seen you on the television. I thought, God, I've, I've not even played any reserve games yet, I'm on the telly, but he was talking about the cartoon, obviously, so uh, it's, it came from then, it stuck that night and it's stuck ever since, and I'm, I seem to be known as that now, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's day six of the German campaign and the gruelling training schedule continues relentlessly. So what is a typical day in the life of a footballer on pre-season tour actually like? Can be draining at times, you know. It's, it's, it's uh, you know difficult to to be like, you know that sort of mentally intense for you know, say 10, 11, 12 days. Um, so it is difficult, yeah, but it's not as if it's uh, unbearable. Michael Stewart started his career with Manchester United, but he has since won the distinction of being the only player ever to play for the Hearts, move to the Hibs 
and return directly to the hearts. Let's all hope it's a long time before it happens again. The morning's training session is followed up with a relaxing but necessary visit to one of the club's regular masseurs, Alan Robson. I think if you train twice a day and then when you come home and you start training once a day and start relaxing and then the fitness should kick in, the freshness should kick in. You know, the workload's been done. So I think it's important between sessions to do as many things as you can to recover, whether it be ice baths, whether it be um, massage, whether it be bringing in the right, taking in the right food in. It's all very important. It's all very important to just to treat the body like a like a prize motor car. <laughs> Or a, or a prize racehorse. <laughs> Favourite quote? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm thinking of. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about a favourite, but there's definitely one that sticks out. Uh, no, I don't think you can read it out. It's, it's too vulgar. Uh, but it definitely sticks out when you look over at the board. There's large black somebody's pressed hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> and there's a few underlined uh, words uh, i think that's the one that sort of sticks in the mind following a light lunch most of the players relax or sleep for an hour or two in their hotel rooms but for michael it's his turn for the daily media press conference Part of the, the daily um, role here pre-season for the Media and Communications Department is to make sure we have as much access as possible uh, to the players and that way the fans can find out first hand. I mean obviously the fans aren't here in Germany or Austria but they can find out through the media and that's important to us to communicate the message that the fans are saying. So how do you decide who gets put up to uh, we, we We operate a rota system but obviously at certain points certain people will be of more interest the whole team, you know, collectively, the calibre of the players, I wouldn't say there's any one specific person, you know, um, but, uh, you know, a massive team. As Michael gives his interview to the Sunday Mail, his teammate Christoph Berra is grilled by the Sun, the Edinburgh Evening News and the Daily Record. And playing well and improving and impressing, hopefully my time will come I'm still chucking it down back home. But that's not the end of it. Lawrence Brody, the Hearts marketing manager, is lining up Michael for another Q&A session. Well, you know, obviously there's been a great turnover of uh, players since I was, uh, you know, I was last year, and um, a lot of different nationalities and uh, different characters. So, you know, it's been good to meet all the new boys, and um, it's, it's been enjoyable. And as I said, the fact that we've been away from home it uh, enables you to sort of get to know them quicker than it would be if you were back home. The first thing I do is I come back to the room and get that on the computer. But again, my time management is important. So get that on, we capture it straight as it is, using the using the firewire cable onto the computer, and then I get one or two other bits and pieces ready. For example, we've got the intro graphics and so on, uh, which are pre-recorded. So that's loud. Um, but we get those bits and pieces and we get we get all that ready and uh, do it as quickly as possible. And the aim is always to get it sort of uploaded and, and ready by by the uh, by the afternoon. So this is the uh, the page coming up on the website now. Michael, you've been back at Hearts now for a couple of weeks. I think we've probably broken new boundaries on this trip. I think even as an SPL club, we've broken new boundaries in terms of what we've been able to provide and what we've been able to do in terms of how far we've pushed the limits. Be that through the interviews, be that through uh, you know, the full extended highlights package and so on. And I think. Uh, I think it's the feedback's been positive, it's been successful, and what we've noticed in particular is that an uptake in subscribers, numbers have gone up uh, in both of the trips. For Michael, the long day continues. The second training session of the day begins at 4.30. It's no secret that the fitness coaches prefer this session as the players are getting too tired to moan and complain. Every session of every day is carefully controlled and monitored by top sports scientist Andy Murray, who, like most fans, has the experience to spot any slackers. Without naming the names, is there a couple of chances out there? Then? There's a few geysers occasionally. Not always the same people, but uh, you, need, you know who you need to watch <laughs> without, without naming any names. 
to where they wear these belts here, just place them just around their chest, just under their nipples, on the on the, next to the skin, and they all have their own watches as well that will give them real-time feedback of what their heart rate is. Every five seconds we're recording their heart rate, uh, and we we'll download it and look at it later, so we can see who's uh, who's been working hard and and, and who hasn't, uh, who's got something at the session and who hasn't. So if they don't train as hard as they, they can, we can get them back in the afternoon or, or, or the next day and, and do the extra work that they've, they've not done in the session. We've got Michael's session up on the screen here, um, and it tells us a few things. It tells us that on average he worked at 64% for the whole session, and then we've broken the session down into different sections here. Intensity that Michael was working at just at the end, 88 and 86, these games are the ones we probably compare across the squad. And if we just look at Michael and Yuho together, just for comparison, so there's Michael at the top and Yuho there, and they both work about 88% for the games, but there's some differences. Throughout. Oh right, so there's no there's no hiding. There's well, there's no hiding place at all. Every, it's some people managers are good at just seeing it with their eye, but this you know the numbers don't lie. So if people don't work, then uh, it shows up. But uh, Brandon there, Paula, <laughs> um, that just basically monitors your heart rate and your beating things like that. Just so the uh, you know the sports scientists and the fitness people and things like that they can sort of tell in terms of how hard you've you've worked. So if the session, you know, over a period of time, say like a week, if, you, if your heart rate's, you know, uh, too high, maybe we want to give you a bit of rest or whatever, if it's too low, work you a bit harder. Yeah. So it's quite good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Aye, sorry, Michael, you were saying. <laughs> sorry, you were saying. That's me finished. <laughs> How's the heart rate? Oh, that is yeah. shot through the roof. <laughs> The following day, and Hearts are on their way to their third and most competitive of the scheduled games in the German Tour against Dutch First Division team Heracles Almelo. But even at this less than impressive Sunday league ground, the loyal Jambos still turn out. Have you follow them everywhere, yeah? Mainly, mainly. All the home games, most of the away games. We've got a wee girl now, so the away games have, uh, <laughs> away games have stopped, well, apart from this. <laughs> this was instead of a beach holiday. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, yeah, one of the youngest yeah. supporters uh, the house has got, isn't it? <laughs> she is, yeah. Right. And Four first, months. And first, first word. First, first word's going to be Jambo. Yeah, well, I think so. Are you going to smile? It's a first for Stevie Frail, as he's forced to deliver his half-time team talk in an alfresco dressing room. Back in front, right? Because when we get any Michael, we get any Egan, we get our side. Every time he goes into Michael, especially, he's looking to go diagonal, right? Which is great. But there is times, I'm telling you, at the back, see if you just do it early, Andres will catch them out. You're in a couple of times that they're very square, and you'll catch them. A convincing and impressive 5-1 victory and everybody's happy and looking forward to the final piece of the pre-season story. Expecting the Barcelona squad tomorrow but all the big names will be there so we just got confirmation today that Henri will be there, Eto will be there so yeah we're looking forward to it. Contrast a new camp from Murrayfield to this one. <laughs> That's it, well this is what it's all about, yeah. grassroots. There's more of that. Mm -hmm. the, from the bandwagon is back in Edinburgh, where signs of the grassroots of the new Tynecastle Stadium are just emerging. Pedro Lopez, the deputy CEO, is in charge of the stadium redevelopment. It's been a long process till now, and uh, with the council taking appropriate decisions on in March, the uh, club making great efforts to finalise the design of the stand. Uh, and there is the opportunity to submit. We were targeting on the 31st of September to submit the application, and from there, 
will be expecting the application to be the, the warrant to be given to the club in some five months so we can start building at the beginning of the new season go up here well, as for the ground, those dreams I had, sadly it takes longer to make them real. I can say at the moment that there's a clash between two aspects of Scottish life, whiskey production and football. It looks like we're heading towards a compromise. We're preparing our submission to the City Council and it'll be up to them to say yes or no to our plans. After they see it, we'll know which concept we're allowed to work with. It's either going to be one stand to redevelop or else the entire ground. At the moment, it depends on both the city authorities and the whiskey company next door. So what, what will the actual capacity of the new main stand be when it's developed? So you know, at the moment we have 18,000 in the stadium. When yeah. we develop this, it will be close to 25. 25, right. Okay, so that's going to bring this capacity up to, what, just 10, just over 10? Over 11. 11. 11, over yeah. 11. Here, lift our stairs. If approved, this multi-million pound investment will bring a stadium with a minimum capacity of just under 25,000. Have new corporate and hospitality suites improved facilities for fans, and a restaurant with a view of the castle. On another horizon is another revolution. Karina Goldberg, based at Tyne Castle, is in charge of a launch of Hart's own clothing brand, the R Revolution, a first for any Scottish club. R Revolution is a dedicated brand concept. Um, so basically, it's a fashion brand as you know, um, that has been fully designed, um, produced uh, and made in Italy. This is um, the ladies' t-shirt, but it features in the whole view um, the oldest ever crest, hearts crest, that has been designed and uh, made in the late 19th century. Okay. That's one of the other items. All that is this historical value that is being portrayed on the items, giving them more than just the merchandising approach, but making them proper luxury slash fashion slash historical value products. Karina is on her way to a catwalk rehearsal in preparation for the real launch of the R Revolution in a few days' time. And just having that, because that, you know, even if like you get like, like that one's what size that? That's, like, that's a medium, that's a I think. When the rehearsal ends, the real show begins, and two of these wannabe celebrities will be signed up as the faces of the R Revolution. But the real celebrities are the players themselves. Ruben Palazuelos has been on trial for several weeks, but today he's signing for the hearts. To create the club I want, we do need some foreign players. But in future, when everything's working well and the system's ticking over nicely, then I see our target as accumulating the very best players that Scotland has to offer, um, so that our academy would encourage Scottish youngsters in particular. Today I'm proud that we have Driver, Christoph Berra, Lee Wallace, Moll, Elliot, there are Kelly, Lingo, Armstrong, they're coming on. So this is how step by step we'll build up our club. This is how we're going to build a more Scottish club, so all the players are Scottish, and this is my dream and this is my vision for hearts and players in Scotland. It's the day before the Barcelona match, and as rumours circulate about a possible record-breaking attendance, the meticulous preparations continue. Is Anatoly a bit nervous about facing Barcelona uh, tomorrow? Is he losing sleep? That's the fate of every head coach that can be, you know, losing sleep before important games. And how long is it going to be? How long is it going to be before he loses his hair? 
я уже потерял свет, а количество не хочу терять. Over at Tyne Castle, the ticket sales are hotting up, and it seems the Barcelona clash is attracting a whole new generation of jambos. I'm taking the two. I'll be the first heart screen. Wait, see. Where are tickets for again? Two. Two. Right, and I don't want a child. Oh, you take your boy or grandson. Oh, now you've given me age, Lucy. Hi there. Can I have an adult and a child for the Barcelona? Yep. This is his first game, he's only just turned five, so got me his heart stripped and he's getting brainwashed as we speak. We've just broken the Hearts all-time home record crowd, um, 53,000. 396. Just been broken, so it's when was that This morning, literally in the last 15 yeah, when minutes. Was the, crowd, the last crowd? 1932 against Rangers in the Scottish Cup, third round. Like so it's a 75-year record. It's just been broken. So it's it's great. It's really it's really great. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good going, yeah, isn't it? Nice. Yeah, really really good. That's all been a lot of hard work. A lot of people, but this the place will be buzzing tomorrow. Meanwhile in the Barcelona dressing room. They may be one of the biggest and best known clubs in the world, but they are, after all, only human. And they too show signs of nerves. All real fans have their favourite team lineup, but for this match, it could have been very different. All the players want to participate, all the players want to play, all the players who were feeling unwell and injured have suddenly recovered. I've even had parents of players asking me, why isn't my son playing? The head coach will have all his players at the pitch on the day, and I asked him if he would let me out for a game. Even if it was the 91st minute, can I go on? I brought my new boots and my new strip, and I told him I was ready, but he told me, no, sorry Vlad, you haven't been training. Barcelona win, 3-1. For the crowd, making their way back into the city, their big day is over, and the conversations turn to the next match. But for the Hearts staff, the work continues. 
the new faces of the Hearts Our Revolution brand have been chosen. To Cyril and David Pride. And over the coming seasons, the fans were able to spot their faces in unexpected places. Just a mile away, it's time for the obligatory post-match interview. And tonight, it's an opportunity for Lawrence to interview a well-known football enthusiast. Hi, Lawrence. Hello. The Hearts World website is an opportunity to connect directly with the real fans, avoiding any distortions. The fans understand everything, and the fans know good football. But the way it's reported, and the media needs to earn their money, of course, and... Uh, Basically, they create a show business instead of reporting the real football. I understand the media, but my real truth lies with the fans. I want to be with the fans and provide them with good football, and I'll keep doing this as long as God allows me. Don't 